So uh, very, very pleased to uh, introduce one of our own. For all of you know, Phil has uh, been you know, a giant in the field of ultra-fast uh, physics and many other areas of physics education. Um, I had looked at his, his CD this morning to figure out what to say, and it was like a mile long. Uh, so I, I just I really can't do that to do it, but I'm going to try to give you the, uh, the scatter. Um, so he's an undergrad at Harvard and PhD uh, someplace across the bay. Um, <laughs> yeah, don't call it a Gibson. Um, either of them. <laughs> um, he became a professor uh, at uh, Michigan after doing a stint in a lab before. Um, he, he became a professor at the uh, University of Michigan. I think they play something with like a ball. So he was there uh, from uh, 1990 all the way to 2005 when we saw him away. And I was uh, a really good um, he founded and, and, and directed for many, many years the Pulse Institute at Stanford and Slack, it's like the show Institute before world class physics here. Um, and he was the department chair of both in science, and director of chemical science at Slack. Um, he's a fellow of ABS of the Society. Um, he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, NAS, uh, AAAS, like all that kind of stuff. Um, he's been the president of the Optics Society, been the president of, of APS, so he knows his stuff. Um, he won the Norman Rand Prize a year ago, a really big deal by the APS. But what you probably don't know about him is that he grew up on a farm in Iowa, and he still has a farm. They, his family, his family still has a farm, he's only about the property. So you can ask him about that. Okay. Okay, thanks Thank very much. It's a pleasure to, uh, to, to do this. I, I, I wanted to give you kind of an overview. Um, and so, you know, kind of start with you of what um, my half of the quantum AMO world does, because it's not the half that does what the program is like. But it's all atomic physics, and all atomic physicists are one. I'm going to start with something. I'll just bet none of you know. How many of you know who Manfred Eigen is? Okay. The inventor of the Eigen <laughs> <laughs> No. I am an and and uh, he, I, I, you know, the, the thing that drew me to Eigen, I didn't know the one here. I'm a comic physicist. We don't know this stuff. Uh, but uh, I was reading his citation because I was kind of doing something for the other Nobel Prize lately. And you'll put 1967, awarded for studies of extremely fast chemical reactions affected by disturbing the equilibrium by means of very short pulses of energy. That's what I do. The guy won the Nobel Prize for 1967. Didn't you even know who he was? So I read this Nobel address and it had something really important in it. Uh, what he was interested in was the fact that you know, before that, we had chemical reaction rates by stirring stuff together, and you were really limited by how fast you could stir it. And he discovered that by exploding a, uh, an acoustic pulse through the mixture, you could uh, measure much faster rates. That's why he got it. So when he gave his address, he said, you know, he's learned how to look at these kinds of time scales, which is from these log scales and seconds. Or chemistry, but the important stuff, and I love that he said this, the important stuff is down here. These times are impossibly fast. They're immeasurably fast. But those are the times that we study now. Yeah. So uh, that's so so I want to get directly into those time scales. So what are they? What are they? Uh, we're physicists, right? We look at what the uh, fundamental sizes of things that are this H bar and masses, and that gives us some idea of the scale of stuff. Um, in that sense, the scale of speed, the scale of speed for something to happen in a quantum system like a molecular system, well, at least right over H bar, which is 22 angstrom per femtosecond. So, that means, since the stuff we're talking about is only about an angstrom, 
that we have to get past the femtosecond barrier if we want to see it. Uh, and you know, skip a few examples. All what atomic physicists do, totally back of the envelope kinds of examples. Um, how long does it take for an electron to depart an atom? Well, you know that it's moving like atomic type velocities, and you know how big an atom is. So that ends up being considerably less. And our second second is the characteristic time scales, but we better be able to measure those time scales if we ever want to see that. Um, another example, and I I use the term evaporative cooling because I know that I'll be speaking to an audience that knows what that means. Quantum evaporative cooling happens even on an atomic scale, but it goes by a different name, or get my decay. And the idea is that if you create a system that's hugely out of equilibrium by, say, removing the most deeply bound electron in the system, it will relax by evaporative cooling. Here's the evaporative cooling happening. And the electrons that come out are OJ electrons. And how long does that take? Well, it depends on how long it takes for these electrons to know that that happened. And you can, and that the characteristic time scale for that is the interaction uh, between the electrons, the electron electron interaction. And again, that's on the order of a couple of femtoseconds. And now here's a third example, an important example. We, we can pause processes that happen in atoms also. And so this process is field ionization. This is turning up the electric field of a laser so high that the electrons that are the defining ion just simply become unbound because they feel that force in addition to the binding force. So that, that pathway opens up if the field is higher than some characteristic field strength. Uh, and that has to happen over a small part of the cycle. And so that, again, gives us an opportunity to measure and even to initiate processes that are effective sectors of that. OK, great. Well, I, I, could have, I could have put this up here in 1960 or 1950. And I, and I could have said, this is the important time scale. Let's study this. So why didn't we do it? What's going on? Why didn't we do it? And of course, the, the reason is that we, we had to wait to make sources, basically camera flash bulbs and camera shutters that were fast enough to view that kind of motion. And then it's only happened in more recent decades. And, and, that, uh, and there's uh, two paths that I would use both of them uh, to, to mm -hmm. those kinds of sources. Now, one of them has recently become super famous because the people who, who originated it just won the Nobel Prize in the past year. And that's the strong field path. That is this idea of field ionizing an atom, which I pointed out must happen that fast. If you can turn that into a light source, and you can, these folks show that you could do it, then that light source is a good black bulb for looking at fast processes. And here uh, from the Nobel, you know, you can download from the website what they thought was the important literature. Here's the, the demonstration of a subconscious second pulse by Ernst Proud uh, using a method that was uh, discovered by Arnie Bouvier, who herself was studying a process that had been discovered by the Pierre Agassiz. So those are the guys who did this. Um, it's based on laser induced tunnel ionization. It produces coherent pulses. You could call them laser pulses. You could call them coherent pulses. Coherent pulses, but they're very weak. They're uh, energies of phantom joule. That turns out to be a weak energy if you want to interact with atomic media. So that's enough to make the first atomic method, which they did. And so they're justly recognized for that. The other method is half a second X-ray pulse with a completely different path to making short pulses, but we use these as well. Uh, the reason that we can use these is that this was invented here at Stanford and not a long time ago, either 2018. Uh, and uh, I will say a little bit about how they did it. The most important thing here are, are, um, are uh, Ago Marinelli and Tryon and, um, and, and um, uh, how do you mean? Uh, they kind of really invented the x ray laser. These guys invented the out of second pulses. And if you want to compare the high harmonics pulses down at femtojoules and rather low uh, vacuum ultraviolet energies 
So what they're able to do now, their pulses are up here in the uh, tens to hundreds of microvolts range. So that's plenty of power to blow apart, you know, necessarily want to do, but to study, to interrogate anything that's going on on the side of the Okay. There's a rather large crowd of people that does this, not very many of whom are in this room, but a few of you are. So thanks for coming. Um, and uh, they're uh, mostly located in physics and applied physics, but not entirely that way, or at Slack. And on this side of the divide are the ones that already have their PhDs. One of them's even wearing his other shoes. And then the other side is the students and, and roughly equal, equal numbers. And I'll point out a few things that they're doing. I can't talk about all the stuff that these people are doing. I want to talk about a few things. Uh, and uh, the faces show people who are involved in this kind of work. Um, uh, first, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of examples of strong field at the second and even at the second physics. That is the, the type of physics that was used to make the arc second pulses for the Nobel Prize, but which we continue to study. Um, a couple of experiments I'll show you. First of all, this business of tunnelization, we can now image it, we can visualize it. In an experiment, here's, here's, here's the electrons flowing back and forth in momentum space and a laser field there, you can see it. That's Nick Werby's work. He's a, he, he's a, a grad student here. Um, Dr. the second, time is all strong field to do Coulomb explosions is something we can use this for. We can use it in molecules and image uh, ultra fast processes in molecules. That's Andy Towers' work. And he's right upstairs in there. Actually, he's uh, sick today, but would be there for you. Uh, and he's, you know, I'll show a little bit about that work. And then the other two examples will use the new X ray out of second technology. Here again are the people involved. In this work, and I'll show you a couple of examples. One is actually viewing this evaporative cooling process, this fundamental OG mining process, in time on a time scale. And the other one is what you probably always thought molecular movies were supposed to be, and that is filming a molecular movie by just imaging its motion using X rays, which have a short enough wavelength to be able to image things from processes. And then, yes. Why is it a bunch of tiles? Oh, well, I'll explain that in a minute. This is just the kind of intro. Yeah, really good question, but you'll have an answer for it. Okay, so let's get to these four topics. Um, <laughs> won't say a lot about each one, but I'll give you some, some feeling for why this kind of physics is interesting and also accessible. So we can do this kind of stuff. Okay, well, one way to initiate electron motion is through tunnel ionization, and it is, of course, the way that was used to make the second pulses in the lab uh, over the last quarter century. Um, field ionization is exponential in the in the barrier height, so that's this expression. This is the tunnel ionization rate as a function of the size of the field for a Coulomb bound system. So when you have an electric field. Uh, at some times during the cycle, electrons are emitted in one direction and uh, depending uh, along the polar, uh, polarization and the other half of the cycle, they go the other way. Good question. Yeah. So F doesn't have units? Or... Oh, everything is in atomic units. I forgot. I was an atomic group. I thought it was the Ross. Everything's in atomic so should I say, do you know atomic units? Yes. Okay. okay. In atomic units, H bar is one, the mass of the electron is one, and fundamental electric charge is one. The speed of light is not one, it's a fast speed, it's one over alpha, 137. Uh, and, <laughs> and so uh, that, that's right. I, I would ordinarily have a whole slide talking about why that's important. <laughs> we just use atomic units all the time, you don't even think about, right? Looking at the atomic units, yes, there we go. They agree. Um, all right, we have to collect these electrons that are field ionized and, and image them. And so we do that. Here's the focus, here are the atoms. They sail onto the two dimensional plate here. And when we look at the plate, we can extract the momentum distribution of the electrons produced. And it looks something like this. And uh, here's moment, also atomic units, by the way. Amir, this is 
the, this is uh, 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 the uh, momentum of the electrons. And the characteristic scale where this happens won't surprise anyone that it's on this scale because we had to use strong fields to make these electrons come out of the Coulomb system in the first place. So this is the vector potential. This arrow is the vector potential size of the laser field that caused this to happen. And so you can see that that characterizes the moment. There's, there's lots of other stuff to anonymous pictures, lots and lots of stuff. Uh, one thing that's obvious are these consecutive rings like ripples. They are separated by H bar omega in energy. This is the momentum plot, that's why they converge. But this, they're, they're each one photon away from each other in energy. Kind of reminiscent of the idea that they're actually absorbing an integer number of photons and they can only absorb an integer number of photons. And that is a limit of strong field line decision. It's, of course, not necessary on a fraction of a cycle. But it does happen in multi sided too. Okay, say a little bit more about what you learn by looking at those plots. Um, one of the things that you learn is that there, there seem to be lots of different classes of trajectories that the electron can take once it's been tunnel ionized. So here's a little map. This is, this is distance away from the nucleus of an atom. Here are the two saddle points when the field is pulled one direction or the other direction for where the tunneling <laughs> so tunneling happens here, half cycle later happens here. And look at the different ways that kind of an electron just sails out and produces a momentum on your plot. Sometimes it goes the other direction and then the laser field turns it around, but it ends up at the same place on your plot and so forth. There's lots of different classes. I just have that four characteristic ones here. You can, you can uh, classically uh, you use Newton's equations to classically plot what happens to those electrons after they're emitted with the different classes. Uh, this is in cycles. And from that comes the idea that all of the ionization had to happen close to the peaks, which is what you would expect would be the case anyway. So all of that makes a certain amount of sense. Now, how can we how can we make a, a measurement? That will actually you know, pull out these, these moments of tunneling. You know, when the tunneling happens. Well, there's lots of ways. I'll just show you one. This whole talk is filled with an example of what we do since we do lots of stuff and have done it for many years. But a cool thing that is done by 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 <coughs> Nick Worby uh, uh, and his and his uh, colleagues is we add a little bit of second harmonic. To the laser field. So now it's got some omega t on the beds, but also two omega t with a phase shift that we can. So what does that do? That distort this is this small, but it's very small. So that just distorts this sine wave a little bit, it tweaks different parts of it depending on the phase. And if we look at the differential, how much extra electrons did you produce and in what momentum did they come out as a result of that, you can actually you can plot out where the ionization happened for every point in this momentum plot. And here is the thing that I showed you on the, on the, on the intro slide. Here is the result of that as a function of phase, as a function of phase. Now, it makes a pretty picture, but if you really want to analyze what's going on, you should figure out what was the peak phase for every point on this plot, so that's easy to do just by analyzing every one of those pixels and finding out what the peak phase is. And here the phase bar is on the left, on the right. You can see that the there's a, a bunch of direct electrons coming out when the field is pulling in this way. But a half a cycle later, even higher energy electrons come out in the same direction because they bounced off the atom and got an extra kick by the laser field a half cycle later. And the same on the other side, and there's way more information than that here as well, but I just wanted to give you a flavor for, for how you can measure those times. So here, for example, on the outside are, are the, uh, the, the bouncers, the ones that got extra energy. And there are also some 
second return scatter. <laughs> but had to actually bounce it twice, they end up in these little islands. So that, that's the sort of thing that, that one can extract in this kind of thing. Now there's there's more, of course. Uh, if I blow up one second of this, you can see that in addition to these concentric rings, first of all, the rings aren't really perfectly concentric, but also there are these, these dark regions or these nodes. In fact, this has sometimes been called the spider, this pattern. And there are other patterns too. I'm just focusing on the spider from the CDC. What causes the spider? What causes it is the fact that there are multiple trajectories to get to each one of these momentum points. And sometimes they destructively interfere and sometimes not. So those are the two trajectories that I showed there. They, they look similar, but notice that one of them had to cross back through the mid plane because it was attracted by the Coulomb potential on its return. And the other one didn't, and they end up in the same place. And so they did take a different path with a different time. And uh, so we have to find a way to analyze that too. Now that's a little bit more sophisticated. I would say this is the this is the one slide that I expected to not follow at all. Uh, not, nonetheless, I'll show you this is the network is great achievement, actually, I think, as even the given the field. We can take a beautiful pattern like this and break it down into figuring out what the processes were that contributed each one of these patterns. The way we do that is uh, a, a three-step process here. First, instead of looking at the whole pattern projected onto a Legendre polynomial base, it obviously has the symmetry, so the you know, the easy Legendre, we can do that. We get a bunch of Legendre functions that have noodles in them as a function of momentum distance away from the the, the, the origin here, here it's up here. Okay. Now each one of those you can scale from momentum to energy and then Fourier transform. Why? Because if you Fourier transform a spectrum, the result is a time correlation function. What times are getting correlated? It's the two different times of launch of the electrons that contribute to interference patterns in that region. And so we say that looks kind of weird. Uh, here's the time correlation function for one of the Legendre. We see it's, it's really dominated by one cycle because obviously, mostly, you're seeing interference between stuff that happened and then stuff that happened a cycle later in your oscillating laser field. But there's more, and all the stuff down here shows those other interferences in a very direct way. So uh, and, and, yeah. and the Legendre basis is somehow about a certain percent. The Legendre basis is simply a way of, of, of uh, taking that pattern apart into a bunch of one dimensional basis functions that are orthogonal to each other, add up to that whole picture, but each one can be treated as a one dimensional object to be Fourier transfer. It's just that it's, it's not the only way to do it, it's the way that experimental physicists would naturally do it. Um, and so what am I showing here? All I'm showing is one way to analyze what the Legendre, what all of this uh, Legendre stuff is doing is to put the pattern back together again, but filter, here's an edge filter moving along. And you see the original pattern that I showed you is changing as different parts of the interference get filtered out. You can make a window filter as well. Here's a, a filter where I'm only looking at the part of the momentum spectrum that occurred because of interference between particles that were launched, electrons that were launched between a half a cycle and three quarters of a cycle away from each other. So that was delta T. Okay. Well, doesn't look that different. Some, some parts are now really emphasized, like this part, and that part is caused by these two trajectory interferences. Uh, and you know, this, this pulls all of this out. So again, not a full description of everything that we're doing, but it's kind of due to the flavor of how you can analyze these things to get real sub-cycle, have a second information about the trajectories of electrons away from the away from the atom. Okay, so let me now. Move on to using the strong fields 
to ionize a molecule. And I'm choosing water here. We've done a lot of studies of water. This is Andy Howard's work for the for the most part. You know, um, what we're trying to do here is film the motion of the water molecules but that are driven by tunnel ionization. And the way we're going to detect their motion is uh, by looking at the momentum of the fragments that are produced following the ionization. This is Coulomb explosion energy. It's, it's a standard, in a sense, it's a standard kind of a technique, but we want to use it to understand the subcycle benefits of strong field number second processes. Um, when a laser hits a water molecule, the field ionizes it, many electrons can come out. The molecule explodes uh, and produces either two body decays, this is deuterated water, so D plus and OD plus, or three body decays. Uh, and we uh, can uh, look at three body decays where the oxygen is neutral and also where it starts. And, and those are the channels <coughs> mostly that, that we focus on. But I just want to show you again, not a full analysis for this problem. But you know what? What do those thermal explosion energy look like, and how do I figure out anything about time from the fact that I see that? Okay. Well, first, here's what they look like. That's cool. Again. Here, the field ionization happened with a six femtosecond infrared laser pulse. Six femtoseconds in duration. A couple of seconds. That's really what it was. Um, and the uh, uh, inset here shows. The ionization as a function of the, the uh, orientation of the molecule with respect to polarization. And this shows what, the, in the mo molecule frame, what the explosion is. So, in the molecule frame, frame, the explosion clearly has two different channels for deuteron ions, which are away from each other. And here is the oxygen ion going in the other direction. Um, the angles imply the molecular geometry. This is how Coulomb explosion is used. The angles imply the geometry, so we can see how the geometry compares to the normal bent geometry of water. We basically see that the molecule is starting to become more linear, that angle is opening up, and the laser polarization isn't aligned with any particular direction in the molecular plane. This distribution just goes because, because we don't have those fragments. We know. What the, what the angle was, and so we can histogram all of those together, and that's the distribution. Okay, now this was a six times a second pulse. How does it change if we move to a 10 times a second pulse? We'll add a couple of cycles of the laser field, and now you can begin to see much more linear motions lining up much more. They're becoming more collinear. That's a strong hint that the molecule is distorted by the polarization. Um, you also see that the relative strength of these two channels change. These two channels correspond to having the oxygen be neutral or charged. And that's changing uh, in favor of uh, dominating the tritetonic channel. Uh, as we make the pulse longer, not surprising. My nice is one more time. Okay. Go to 19 femtoseconds. Things really do start to change. There's more evidence for internal molecular motion. The dyntad ion channel, that's these guys, that's a vanish. You don't see that at all. And the laser polarization is becoming strongly aligned to the molecule. So that means that even though the molecules are random in our gas, by the time they fly apart, they're not random, they're not randomly oriented anymore. They got pulled into alignment by the laser. And then finally, to go all the way to 40 femtoseconds. And at 40 femtoseconds, there's a new dyntad ion channel that appears. Probably formed by unbending on the singly ionized surface. Um, okay, fine. So, great, that's very qualitative. Uh, how can we make that more quantitative? So, the way we've approached this is instead of just looking at single pulse with looking at different pulse duration, let's actually try to make one of these time delay movies out of it by having two 600 per second pulses with the delay. So, here's an example where they're both. About 18 femtoseconds, what the two patterns look like. You see, they're, they're quite different, uh, suggesting that having the strong laser field on really makes a difference. You do ionize one more time, but you don't get a chance to do as much or to separate it. But some things are quite similar. That is, the ratio of tricad and dicad and uh, track as we change that. 
but we can really get much more, much more quantitative. In fact, get into the business of really feeling like you're making a movie, see how things are moving by, by uh, observing as a function of time delay, any of these observables. So here's three. You just look at the momentum of the deuterons, the distribution of momentum of the deuterons. As a function of separation between two systems, you begin to see these two channels open up. It's even more complicated if you look at the oxygen. Clearly, more than one possible thing can happen. And then this is the opening end. This is the beta end of the two momentum. Yes, sir. How do you identify which channel, like the dication, et cetera, that they come from? Yeah, if you identify, you can. I, there's a couple of ways. First of all, in this case, they're well separated by energy, and the tricata has more potential energy. By pulling that electron away, you now have three charges. So then, so, so this is where the fat end with Jimmy didn't even come up here. Okay. So you can do that. The, the other one that you can do that, and this is extremely important, is that you can you can compare what you expect to happen from the Newtonian trajectories on the potential energy surfaces of the different charge states. It can mm -hmm. often be quite different. That's another way that we do that. Um, okay. So, all right, so that's interesting. We can compare that to calculations uh, where we place the initial molecule on the cation extension surface and just let it move uh, from real quantum calculation. And, and from that, we begin to see that some of the calculated effects are clearly observable here. We can see these, the, a lot of different kinds of trajectories. And then that can turn, turn back into a, a real detection of where the average water molecule have evolved. So the dominant trajectory here, which is the one that you see with these, this is, these are the calculated trajectories. This is the data. So the, the, these lines plot in calculation, what you would expect were symmetric breakup of the water. And you see, oh, mostly our data are strongly in agreement with that, but there's some other stuff going on. And the other stuff going on is strongly in agreement with another set of trajectories, trajectories where it's two body decay at first, and then the OH or DH gets ionized the second time after the split around the two times. And those are the dotted lines, and you can see that it's a minority, but a lot of our data follows that way. So this is really getting us very close. Again, I'm not telling you everything that you drive to this. You can get, you get the, the intensity of these uh, of, of these uh, signals is, uh, is is one of the most important things to tell you which excited electronic states are the ones that be populated and in which ratios. And it tells you also about transition that states cross each other. But this gives you a feeling for how you feel like that. Okay, now with the rest of my time, I want to switch over to the other two topics where instead of using strong fields, why don't we use a new tool that was developed here anyway? And a second X-ray pulse. So that is an X-ray pulse from, from the uh the Zero Light Source at Slot. Um, and uh, you know, you see what you slot here to Linux. The light source that we're using is this part of the LINAC, and then the experimental areas are down here. And the actual laser is uh, a bunch of uh, undulators, inside of which is a, is a relativistic electron being wiggled. So here is a movie that shows what happens when the electron is so big. They wiggle. And as they wiggle, they create radiation that builds up cycle by cycle. Uh, and, and becomes stimulated radiation. And the stimulated radiation comes out in noisy bursts. So in the first mm, 10 years, nine years of the free electron laser world that I came to live in when I came to Stanford, we have pulses that look like this, noisy pulses. But the fascinating thing always was the individual spikes, which are determined by the physics of the uh, of the uh, interaction of the electrons with their own synchrotron radiation that they're producing. Um, the characteristic size of these spikes, these are all subconscious spikes. If only we could 
to capture one of them, that would really be cool. The intensity of this is humongous. It's uh, it, it's uh, it's a billion times brighter than the second most brilliant sort of thing. So it was plenty of plenty of power. If all I had to do was throw away all the power except for one of these specs, no problem. That would be just fine. So let's see how we can do that. Uh, that process was developed by um, by uh, Hagen Marnelli and, and uh, James Hines, so called Exley project at Slack. And the idea was, in the end, to use these undulators themselves as a way of seeding the X-ray laser action in a way that would only, only amplify one of those spikes. So if you want to think about, again, I'm not giving the whole tutorial on how you do that, but I'll give you some feeling for how you're doing it, because after all, it is important. If you think about that electron bunch, the electrons now, not the light, the electrons are delivered by the lamp with a certain energy spread and a certain time spread. And so you can think of this as the phase space of the electron bunch, an energy time. Okay? The purpose of all of these magnetic things is these are dispersion, these are dispersive devices. They, uh, they get the, the head of the bunch to catch up with the tail by having real path length difference. And so you can treat, you can turn this, this undulator is the thing that does it. You can turn this into a phase space diagram that looks like this sort of V, where most of the electron density is in a very short time. And then run the free electron laser so that it's above threshold for lasing for this kind of electron intensity, but not for the not for the rest. And then you generate a short X-ray pulse. And you do need, need to, to measure that it's short. And for that, we have to invent something. And so uh, the, uh, the, can the movie's camera is an angular street camera. The way the angular street camera works is this short burst of x-rays comes in and it, it ionizes something like ordinary air, you know, or argon or neon or something like that. It ionizes something, but in coincidence, you have a strong circularly polarized laser, strong enough to have its vector potential substantially displace the momentum of the electrons that are produced by the photoionization of the X-rays. When you do that, you get a photoionization pattern that doesn't look like an ordinary dipole pattern, but actually it's displaced by whatever the instantaneous vector potential of the strong laser field was at that point. And by measuring this displacement, you measure basically the time that the electrons came out. You can use that method to measure the shape of any X ray induced process. And the first X ray induced process that you ought to measure is the laser pulse itself. And so here are a few characteristic laser pulse reconstructions from uh, data taken on different pulses. And so we're, we're comfortably making. Um, laser pulse, let's get the histogram of a bunch of pulses. You can see we can, we can pretty much rely on to do that. Okay, now, what's the kind of physics that then you want to study? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about the, you know, me in measuring one of these eva quantum evaporative cooling OG light like this. This one is in uh, nitric oxide, NO. Okay, so, uh, you know, at the atomic physics level, the uh, line, the, the uh, stock number and all the, the level diagram is like this. Uh, the end is a certain distance from the vacuum. Uh, down here, these are the, the ground state electrons. These are the 1s electrons. The 1s electrons get oxygen. They're more deeply bound because oxygen has a higher Z. And those are the two uh, processes that you should see. So if you, if, if, if you come in with Soft x rays at 540 eV, about a half a kilovolt, and just measure uh, as, a, as a function of uh, the energy of that photon. You measure what comes out. You see the edge, this is the oxygen edge, and you see this giant feature, which is actually excitation to balance the physical yes, very well known from synchrotron work. That's what we want to focus. So we're going to populate this 2p pi star resonance just below 
ionization of the oxygen in and out. That, that's what we're doing. Now, once this is populated, what happens? Well, a bunch of stuff happens. You can track what happens by looking at the energy of the electrons that come out in an electron spectrometer. That's, of course, what the street camera does. So there are three main materials. Here's what it looks like. This actually came from the street camera, but I'm, I'm showing you now as an ordinary spectral plot. There are three big peaks, series of peaks. The lowest energy one, at this color of excitation, lowest energy one is just having the same photon ionize out of the nitrogen instead of the oxygen. That produces a 100 EV peak. The second one is the OK electrons that come from, from, uh, uh, from, from, from having uh, created a vacancy here. You create a vacancy with this photon. Well, all of the other electrons are going to say, hot diggy dog, let's cool off and drop down and kick out. And that produces the OJ peaks. There they are. These are the OJ peaks from the ionization of nitrogen. And then way up here are the OJ peaks from the excitation into the 2P pi star of the real state oxygen. This, this vacancy gets filled. And we'll, we'll focus on that. Okay, so in the street camera, same street camera, exactly the same one you use in our cookies. Now you see three distinct lines. Those are these three lines. In fact, I took these data from here. And if we want to see what's happening with the oxygen OJ, we want to be focusing on, on that last peak. So let's do that. Now showing you the actual street camera instead of just. Uh, what happens at time of zero. Now, we're very lucky that we can see the nitrogen because nitrogen is a straight photoionization at 100 dB. That's time zero. We use that as t equals zero for our streaking of the OJ binder. And then everything is then measured as an angle with respect to that. When did the electrons at the oxygen energies come up? And here's a histogram as a function of that street angle. And you can see uh, what you can see, what you can see. Let's, let's analyze it. This resonance that we were exciting, it turns out that it's actually three different excited states that all somewhat overlap. And they all have their own properties as far as their OJ decay. Uh, but in fact, which one we excited is completely ambiguous because this is a coherent, a coherent excitation project. And so the amplitudes for OJ decay of each three of these interfere with each other. And the rate that we see depends on that interference. And that effect causes wiggles in the OJ micro decay. Using those wiggles, which just to, yeah, this kind of information is pretty much impossible to obtain any other way. You need to have this ability to time develop this stuff. And this allows us to directly measure that interaction and the phase shift uh, between and the and the decay difference between the uh, three different uh, decay rates. Again, very broad brush, I'm not showing the details in any of that. There's plenty of details. Um, I just want to get to our, our last uh, example, which is old-fashioned molecular waves. You've got short wavelength light, say 10 kilovolt light, which we can make, you know, a few angstroms uh, wave lines. That's enough to resolve molecular bonds. Let's take a picture of a molecular bond and watch it move. Pretty easy. Okay. So that's the example here. We're going to use elastic scabbards. This is lensless image. We don't have good imaging objects. We're going to look at the Fourier transform type. Lensless imaging, that's called scattering. <coughs> so the the uh, uh, X rays uh, intersect our medium, they scatter from the medium. Here is the scattering radiation. And if the, and if the molecule is wiggling, then the scattering pattern is wiggling. And you can see that the maximum wiggles up and down. And we'll see that on plot. Here's Here's what it looks like. This is for two different cases. One was 
in iodine photoexciting is 520 nanometers, which is to take a side to take the least state of molecular iodine. If you're a molecular iodine fan, you'll know about that. But then we detect it with 1.4 and for metrate, and you can see immediately the wiggling uh, of the uh, of, of, of the process. And then this was with 800 nanometer two photon excitation gives you Raman excitation of the ground state potential energy surface. You can see that as well. This one means. I'm missing something. Are these molecules aligned and no. phase? No, they're not aligned. That's why it's more circular. Well, uh, there's two points there. One, one of the really important points is that this is a, which works for this, but not for this. This is a strongly dipole allowed transition. So it's selecting the, uh, the, the, the molecules which are happen to be aligned. And so you do get a strong dipole shape to the scattering pattern here. This is, I guess, a mostly dominated by Raman process, which is not uh, polarization sensitive anyway. And so uh, it, 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 you don't see that. You don't see any, uh, the strong dipole. Good catch. It shows that you truly know how to do <laughs> Yes. Very technical question. What did the C stand for in C stand? What stands for Cornell? Oh, this stands for Cornell. Yeah, Cornell. So I'm sorry to say that. Is something from Cornell? Oh, yes, there is. Let's get out. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, does that mean it's their camera or? They invented it. They invented it. Nobody uses the camera. Do you have an X? Do we have an X to see us pad? I mean, I can see the pad. Yeah. One of the key chips. Oh, yeah, we're asking about the tiles. Yeah, this is done. These are looking for a real angle here. The tiles aren't that big, you have to have them stand up. So each one of these is a identical tile. Find up and you want one? Okay, the camera, sure, definitely. Uh, okay, so let's see. So yeah, there's lots of ways to view uh motion. Uh and uh, you know, I don't know, I don't remember what I put this slide in. I just want to show all the ways that exactly the same data can be either depicted or calculated of what we were seeing, just the, the, the wiggling. Okay, so that brings me to my wrap up slide. Oh, we're doing it. What I hope that I've convinced you, even though you may not tell your friends, is that I have a second point of the case. Forms the foundation of the complex molecular and chemical processes. And it's set by the fundamental constants. It simply has to be that home scale. Uh, and in order to be an active scientist probing that time scale, that has developed over decades through continuous cycle of laser innovation, experimental discovery. There are now, they're, they're now five Nobel laureates running around. Mm -hmm. Who's got their prize specifically because they contributed to this work getting from we don't have to do this to yeah, now even people like Phil can do this. <laughs> um, and uh, I think the process of discovery in technology of natural review is one of the reasons I came to Stanford. I think it's one of the reasons I went here in DuPont. And uh, it's one of, the, one of the really fun reasons to be an experimental animal physicist. Thanks very much, Green. You put in your rule. I'm not allowed to raise my hand. You're just not allowed to call on. <laughs> Let's not have any other questions and make you raise his hand. <laughs> Anybody? No? Okay. Well, All right, John. Yes. Okay. Uh, oh, we have one? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, um, so I guess the, for me, the, uh, as someone who's sort of adjacent, but Technology just seems absolutely fascinating and amazing. I guess I would ask, them, where are the challenges and opportunities to innovate for the next generation? There, oh, there, there, there are really a lot, but um, you know the, the things that were so you know the extra movie that I shared with you that was that was really low hanging fruit. That's iodine and it's so slow, but there isn't any reason that we can't make these out of second pulses 
can be even more intense than other second filters, maybe even shorter with hard X rays. You don't have to be 500 dB. We can be at 15 kDB. And that is right now, that's we're, we're poised to be able to use that. Uh, if we had that right away, if we didn't have that right away, that's that's what we're 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 pushing to have happen. Um I mean, the, the, the reasons why it isn't happening right now are, are kind of small and technical in our view and not fundamental. So we should be doing that. Now, I think the, beyond that, one of the most important uh, areas that we, we need to understand well is uh, this uh, breakup of a particular channel of electronic motion into multiple channels. I mean, think about uh, photo exciting a, a system and maybe it dissociates and maybe it so it's different and maybe it just gets excited, maybe you know, different kinds of things can happen. Um, all of that is determined by degeneracies that are transient uh, as the electronic system evolves after you initially accept it. And I think that's a, that, that's a, it's a very big challenge, but that's a huge area that we need to explore. And I think we're, we can we will do that. Do that like correlated measurement? That kind yeah, of thing. correlated measurements. Um, we're already making correlated measurements, but we haven't really found the correlated measurement that can, can do this. We, we might, you know, you'd be surprised how much applied mass that we make. Uh, you know, for example, we got all these particles coming out. So can we do five, six, seven particle coincidence or covariance? And the answer is. No, not really. There's some fundamental limits here. <laughs> and we've been kind of learning about those. But I think we'll, as we come to find good uh, ways to overcome them and be natural how to them. So. Um, so I want to ask you a question about this AK microdicine blocking, which you describe as quantum evaporative cooling. If you actually look at that curve, it's not just a a normal exponential decay, the way you would think of as a process that's governed by some rates. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, that, that's, I think that's, that's because the system that's cooling, it's because of the source. Yeah. When, when your coffee cup is hot, it's a mind is getting warm. You know, there's, there's, very little, there's very little coherence left in the motion in this coffee cup. Of course, I could change that by shaking it. Uh, in these quantum systems, they're coherently prepared. So the thing that even though the evaporative cooling itself, you might think of as some kind of uh, process that's akin to a stochastic process, it's actually called the electron electron interactions. And the stochastic part isn't real, it's, it's, the, it's the measurement problem only. But the initial state, that is completely coherent. And that's because you started with pure ground state. And excited, it's coherent radiation. Even though you excited multiple eigenstates, they're all coherent. Characters. And they will be phased in a very deterministic way. And that's the source for the evaporation. And that's the reason that it has to. But, but, the, but the decay itself is Markovian. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so you showed the um, x-rays that you get out of the wiggler as this very nasty looking pattern, uh, but then you have like a particular uh, wavelength and pulse time that you're sending at them. I think you briefly explained this. How do you actually process that nasty output into like a bunch of pulses that you can send to uh, this? Right, so, so you're, that, that, you're right, I only briefly touched on it. It's a really good point. And just to restate it in a way that maybe everybody uh, will will appreciate um, uh, every one of these antisecond pulses is unique because they were all formed by initially building up from spontaneous noise in the undulator process. And also there's, in, there's both technical and intrinsic jitter in the process. The technical jitter is that, hey, this is a kilometer scale object. You know, nobody times things to an out to, to hundred nanoseconds to kilometer long. There's too many opportunities for technical noise, but there's also the intrinsic problem of the, the, the exponential growth in any uh, lacing process has uh, ha has uh, noise associated uh, just from the start, and both of those are there. So rather than solve either of those problems, 
uh, the technique is only measure everything you can on every shot and then rebend. So when we see a pulse come out, at the same time as we're measuring whatever we want to measure in our sample, we're also measuring the time that it came out. We're doing two experiments at the same time with the same X-ray. In the case of the NO, that was that that timing addition mark, that's just given by when did the nitrogen molecules photo photoionize? Because the photoionization process does not have the time delay of the ocean nitrogen decay. It tells us when T equals zero was for that particular X-ray pulse. It'll be somewhere on this circle because remember it's being driven by a circularly polarized speaking field. Wherever that is, that's time zero. And now you look at the rest of the pattern with that at zero. And then when you histogram things together, you blend it over zero. Uh, my next question was. I'll just actually explain where they all like to fill out. Okay. All right. mm -hmm. uh, okay, so you're able to take these molecules and blow them apart, uh, which means you're able to like break chemical bonds. I guess right now you're just like letting the electrons fly off to infinity. Uh, is there a reason that you couldn't like create an artificial chemical reaction where like because of a strong field you ionize something and then it gets attached to some other molecule and study that process? Yeah, re reattachment is, you know, it's, it's one of the, you know, in, in physical chemistry, it's one of the ultra fast when I reattachment. Sometimes, uh, or at least a version of this is called roaming. Roaming actually really refers to a condensed environment where you, uh, I'm not, you, you dissociated something, but the atom, because of the solvent, it ends up getting reattached. But actually, there's also gas phase unimolecular roaming that can happen in some cases as well. Those are kind of halfway getting to the bimolecular case. The really difficult thing, which so far I haven't seen any good experiment that they figure out how to solve this even by brute force, is to have two different reactants coming from different beams, say, colliding, people have dealt with the colliding beams, but knowing when that collision is going to happen and imaging there. And I think that that's what the, the, the one way I know of, like, you know, I think about those things too. How would I do that? The, the best way I can think of to do that is do lots and lots of experiments. And so I favor uh, upgrades to this machine where they increase the rec rate. And they have just done that, although it's not finished yet. But uh, all of these experiments were done at 100 hertz. Uh, uh, we'll be going up to 100 kilohertz and ultimately to megahertz, but without sacrificing that much with respect to the energy. We'll be able to do all the same experiments, but thousand times faster. And, and that's the kind of environment where you could finally say, okay, there'll be enough opportunity. You know, it reminds me of, what, of, of something that we had and then overcame early on in the FPL days, like back in 2009 where we wanted to inject big particles like viruses into the X-ray beam and blow them up. We actually wanted to scatter them, wanted to actually scatter from them. And, you know, measure things about their structure by looking at the scattering pattern. One molecule at a time. And one of the big problems was, how do you make sure that it, it gets in the way of the X-ray beam just when the X-ray beam is there? And they actually solved that problem. So, um, you know, they can do that now with you know, high reliability. So I think using those, you know, trading on those kinds of techniques, I think we'll be able to do high molecular uh, chemical process. Well, has not yet happened. Cool. I think people we'll talk to you about um, marrying the uh, ultra cold molecule techniques and things to place molecules you care about, the reactant you care about, and the position you really want it so you don't have to do this stochastically. It would be very, very reasonable. Uh, that's the kind of uh, protocol, new protocol, which seems like a technical feasible, that people need to keep producing the would be the community. And, you know, the community will, will, will make room for it. We'd like to see those kinds of things. I think, I think those sorts of things. Uh, it was Nicola here from the research proposal, wasn't it? <laughs> Anybody else have questions? Yeah. 
Um, is there anything uh, that you measure how uh, the atomic experiment has disagreed with uh, the article atomic population? Well, there have been, oh, you know, surprising things off now. At every, at every step. Uh, I think uh, people didn't really understand the cooling smoking process and particles at all, uh, uh, driven by x rays, and and myths predicted uh, what would happen in cooling explosion. And now, you know, it seems like it was a long time ago, and now everybody's like really comfortable with what really does happen. Um, and, and there are many examples like that. In fact, th this kind of a phenomenon is, it, is just, in that sense, a delighted problem of any experimental thing. You know, every time you do an experiment, you're, you're, you're challenging your betting that experiments can give insights that theory hasn't got around to giving. And you know, all of those bets, those bets work out a lot of it. Well, let's thank our, our real farmer.